Hey, welcome back, everyone. I want to talk about the Pax Americana and what's happening globally right now. I know there's a lot of stuff happening domestically. I'll tell you right now, what's happening globally is going to reshape the ideas of what the world represents. Uh, in terms of what human rights is, uh, in terms of the values that are protected or not protected globally, all of this is in the process of changing right now. What's being, what's, what's being replaced is what's known as the Pax Americana, the Peace Under America. And I want to explain why this is a big deal. The, the nature of what is protected or not is about to change. And uh, maybe in America this isn't going to hit us too hard, but in a lot of other countries this will absolutely change things. Uh, what America represents is an anomaly on the history of the world stage, and I want to explain why that is and what we're losing right now. Uh, there's some really serious stuff going on. Uh, also, Russia's in the process of moving nuclear weapons to Belarus right now, uh, on the border, of course, with Ukraine. And this is, of course, a direct threat to the United States and its allies. Uh, interesting development. So we'll be explaining what's going on with this and also what's happening behind the scenes. It's going to be an interesting episode to stick around. Uh, that said, those of you on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Rumble, we will jump over exclusively to Epoch TV after about 25 minutes, so be sure to join us there. That said, folks, thank you for being here. Let's jump into the first story. I want to show you what's happening with the nuclear weapons. I mentioned before that Russia has been making nuclear threats. They were talking, for example, about, well, uh, the UK, I believe, was deploying, was providing Ukraine with tank shells using depleted uranium. Now, that's not technically unusual. If you're talking about armor-piercing, you know, rounds of that nature, depleted uranium tends to be what they use. A lot of American tanks also use depleted uranium in their armor. Russia is framing this as a type of deploying of nuclear materials. Um, depleted uranium, you could argue, could fall within that definition, although uh, when, when taken in the context of what they actually mean, they're suggesting moving nuclear weapons, when in reality that's not the case. Uh, they're also talking about accusing Ukraine, for example, of using chemical munitions. There have been videos online showing, for example, uh, what are alleged Ukrainian uh, fighters, especially the ones using drones, creating, storing, and even using chemical weapons. And that would, of course, violate international law. The difficult thing with any of these videos, unfortunately, is it's hard to tell what's real and what's not. Uh, a lot of videos have been debunked. A lot of videos have been shown to have been doctored. And whether you're talking about Russia or, frankly, the Western world at this point, or other countries that just have interest in this, or people who want to joke around on the internet, uh, it's unfortunately very easy to fake videos, and so it's hard to tell what's real and what's not. Uh, but regardless of this, in its propaganda, Russia has been using that as well. The Ukraine is violating international arms control standards, and because of that, it would justify them to meet in like. Uh, in other words, the use of chemical weapons, if not the use of uh, maybe localized nuclear weapons, which they have been talking about for a while now. That brings us to this story. Let me show you. This is BBC. It says, Putin, Russia to station nuclear weapons in Belarus. And it says Russia will station tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus, President Vladimir Putin has said. It says Putin said the move would not violate nuclear non-proliferation agreements and compared it to the U.S. stationing its weapons in Europe, according to Russian state media. You could argue they have grounds to, to do this, frankly. It says Moscow would not be transferring control of its arms back to Minsk, he added. And the U.S. said it did not believe Russia was prepared to use nuclear weapons after the announcement. Uh, U.S. Department of Defense said in a statement, We have not seen any reason to adjust our own strategic nuclear posture. We remain committed to the collective defense of the NATO alliance. It notes as well that Belarus shares a long border with Ukraine and NATO members of po uh, Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia. Remember that Poland is one of the alleged next targets of Russia if its program here succeeds. And it says this will be the first time since the mid-1990s that Moscow will have based nuclear arms outside its country, outside of Russia. Now, folks, I want to go into what's happening a bit on a broader scale with this, because I, I, I've been hinting or talking briefly about some of what's taking place, that the Pax Americana, 
the peace under America, frankly, right now is coming to an end. Uh, this is, of course, the idea that America represents certain values. He, that the, the idea that people are endowed by their creator with certain God-given rights, and that the nature and role of government is to protect those God-given rights. You could also call, the, call this the liberal democratic world order. That is the world order we've lived under since the, since the end, of really, of World War II. And of course, that is the world order that's been clashing, well, with communism and socialism since the beginning of the last century. Now, given the changes that have taken place, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the rise, unfortunately, of the Chinese Communist Party through the help, ironically, of the Western capitalist system, all of this is now whittled away at, the, at what I think America used to represent. And now you see a new totalitarianism rising around the world. Russia under the ideas of national Bolshevism, the Chinese Communist Party with the China model of socialism. Many otherwise free countries have adopted these policies to varying degrees. Most of Europe, even though it does practice, I'd say, more pure democracy, uh, they are moving towards real socialism. In fact, they've adopted many policies of it. Canada is a socialist country. Mexico is a socialist country. Most of Latin America is socialist by now. Most of Africa is socialist. Most of Asia is socialist. The United States is battling deeply with socialist ideologies. And you can even argue after Lyndon B. Johnson that some of the programs we've adopted, even going back to Roosevelt, in fact, uh, that the United States has adopted many socialist policies as well. The world has changed into a socialist-led world order. And that has, of course, remnants of the old values have been fighting against that. You, you can see this ex existing in every country just about. Uh, but they are besieged on all sides, so to speak. And what you're seeing now with the rise of the end of the Pax Americana is the end of the system of basic rights that would protect the individuals trying to resist the tides of history, you could say. Uh, no longer having a system to protect them against tyranny of government. I'll explain what this means. Uh, first, though, folks, we have a sponsor today. Today's advertiser is PeterDemos.org. And they said, What will you do when an unjust law or rule conflicts with your faith? We are watching attacks on our faith coming from both our government and many businesses. And if we, don't act, if we don't know how to act, it may be too late. Unfortunately, many of us know we are, we are to do something, but we don't know when the right thing, time to do it and how to do it. Are we ready for the days ahead? Peter Demos's new book on the duty of Christian civil disobedience helps us think about the seriousness, the risk, and duty of Christians in responding to these unjust laws. Peter applies an unassailable biblical framework to the historical context of when civil disobedience is appropriate to present a solid case for when Christians, in particular, should stand down and rise up. You can purchase the book on the duty of Christian civil disobedience at peterdemos.org. That is P-E-T-E-R-D-E-M-O-S dot O-R-G. And uh, big thanks out to our sponsor today. All right, folks, continuing on what's happening right now, I want to talk about the end of the Pax Americana, which is happening right now. And what this means in terms of, well, the world we left behind, so to speak. Uh, I think what we're watching right now is the rise of global wars and global tyranny. The American Constitution, although, although the American Constitution only applies to the United States, to a certain extent it has been a beacon of light to the entire world. You could even argue, going back to the founding of the United States and the signing of the Declaration of Independence, it was a Declaration of Independence that established the ideas of universal basic rights. The idea that people are endowed by their Creator with, with you know, God-given rights, of course, and that people should be free. In fact, Thomas Jefferson, in the original draft of it, even had wording that would criminal that would they would criticize slavery. In fact, you could argue, of course, Jefferson owned slaves. Um, there were some complexities to that, which is that he inherited them, and under the law, he could not he could not free them because he was in debt himself, and the law forbade him from doing so. There's a lot of complications to it. But regardless of this, the American Declaration of Independence established the American idea, and that American idea was what began the end of slavery in the world. And the American idea 
is what began withering, whittling away as well at the, let's say, tyrannies that existed in every, parts, every part of the world. When the American Revolution took place in 1776, and the Declaration of Independence, sorry, the, the American Constitution was written and signed soon after, what it established was a new idea of what governments are, a new idea of, well, that you and I are endowed with basic rights, and that government is not able to basically trample on us and do whatever the heck it wants. If you understand the way the world was prior to this, tyranny was the way of the world. Uh, it was very much the rule of the conqueror. It was very much the idea that countries go to war, countries conquer one another, the victor is the one who rules by force, and that was just the way the world was. Nations enslaved other nations, nations burned and committed genocides. Uh, the, if you look even at the, the European powers in the United States, you could talk about the Indian Wars, for example, uh, which was actually the French Canadians working with the Indian tribes, notably. Uh, they, they, it was the French Canadians that taught the Indians scalping, and their ways of war included killing everything, uh, killing children, killing women, um, oftentimes in extremely brutal ways, such as cutting the chest open and filling the chest cavity with burning coals. Uh, that was not unusual in the world at that time. If you understand the nature of the way that the found the, the way the original settlers even viewed what they called savages, they saw themselves in them. Understand, folks, the the age of the Vikings was what from the 1700s to the 11 or 1200s. It was only in the 1400s that that the Americas were you know quote unquote discovered. When people saw you know, the Native Americans living as they were, fighting, enslaving each other, and so on. What they saw was not some foreign group of, you know, what they called savages. What they saw was themselves. They saw themselves just 300 years prior. They saw the Germanic tribes. They saw the, the savage Brits, uh, who were, of course, waging their own barbaric wars against the, against the Roman Empire. They saw themselves. That way of life was the norm for the world in every country you go to you can look at madagascar and the tribes there where one of the tribes would take joy for example in tormenting the weaker tribes including uh, pouring boiling water on them and watching them suffer if you look at the original uh, if in fact the journals of uh, christopher columbus you'll know that there were two tribes he discovered or quote unquote discovered in the caribbean one of them being the Carib tribe, which was a cannibal tribe. It was a genocidal cannibal tribe that would depopulate entire islands. They would kill everybody. If you understand even the history of the Roman Empire and its very brutal, very bloody rule, um, at least for several hundred years, from about a hundred years prior to the you know, Jesus Christ, about 200 years afterwards, it was extremely brutal. That was the way of the world. The American idea is an anomaly on the world stage. The American idea established a different concept of the role and nature of governments. The American idea has established this very, I'd say, unnatural blip on the, on the trajectory of human history. And that American idea is what we're now seeing come to an end, or risk seeing come to an end. Let me explain. Daily Mail has this story, and I'm going to lay out what's happening right now. It says, U.S. contractor killed an Iranian suicide drone strike in Syria as Biden orders retaliation precision strikes targeting 11 militants tied to the Revolutionary Guard. That's the Iranian military, which works through subversion. It says an American contractor has been killed and five service members were wounded when an Iranian suicide drone struck a facility on a coalition base in northeast Syria on Thursday, the Pentagon said. In retaliation, President Biden ordered the U.S. Central Command forces to launch precision airstrikes against facilities used by groups affiliated with Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps, killing 11 pro-Iran fighters. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said the airstrikes against the IRGC, a wing of the Iranian military, which is blacklisted as a terrorist group by the U.S., was carried out by F-15 fighter jets. It says the airstrikes were conducted in response to today's attack, as well as a series of recent attacks against coalition forces in Syria by groups affiliated with the Revolutionary Guard. 
It says no group will strike our troops with impunity. Earlier this Thursday, a drone strike killed a U.S. contractor and injured five service members, as well as another American contractor at a maintenance facility on a coalition base near al Hasaka in northeastern uh, Syria. It says they are said to be in stable condition, the Washington Post reported, citing a senior military official. So the Iranian military is targeting, well, targets in Syria. Among the people killed was an American contractor. Iran, in other words, is getting involved in a conflict. America launched counterattacks against Iran. Get this, another story. Missiles slam into another U.S. base in Syria after this. Iran-backed militants retaliate hours after Biden ordered a deadly precision strike on their positions following a suicide drone attack that killed an American worker. So after Iran attacked a target that killed an American contractor, Biden re responded by launching an airstrike. The Iranian militants responded by launching a counterattack against, against us. It says here, the White House insisted America is not seeking a conflict with Iran after President Biden launched a series of retaliatory airstrikes against Tehran-backed fighters who had killed an American contractor. And it goes on. Basically, folks, Iran retaliated after we launched a retaliation strike, and we'll see how far this goes. The Biden administration is saying they do not want a war with Iran, but Iran right now is kicking the hornet's nest. Think of Iran as coming up to, you know, America slapping it in the face, Biden slaps them back, and Iran punches us. It's in our court. What do we do? Biden at this point is not responding uh, much more strongly, but we'll see where this goes. What happens right after that? Russia flies a jet over the same region. Russia, in other words, showing a, showing a sign of um, consolidation, let's call it, showing a sign of support for Iran against the United States amidst all this. Town Hall reports, armed Russian jets fly over U.S. bases prove just how weak a President Biden is. This is their opinion, of course. It says, armed Russian jets have flown over the U.S. military base in Syria. This is where the conflict between Biden, Biden's administration and Iran is now taking place. Again, Iran attacks an American target, Biden reacts, Iran retaliates, and then Russian flies a jet over the, over the same area, showing that if America responds, they will act against us. That is the nature of this threat. It says they've flown a, 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 the jets over the base in Syria every day in March, violating a four-year-old agreement between the U.S. and Russia. Yet Biden does not... That uh, does nothing to stop this, it says. Russian jets have violated the airspace about 20 25 times this month, compared to zero times in February and 14 in January. In addition, according to sources, Russian aircraft have confidently acted aggressively toward U.S. bases in a way that is not typical of an organized military force. And it says they've regularly, they're regularly flying directly overhead of our units, and I've defined directly overhead as within about a mile, no more than a mile offset by one side or the other. While we've got forces right there on the ground at ATG, Lieutenant General Ale uh, Alexis Grinowick, uh, Combined Forces Air Component Commander for U.S. Central Command, told NBC News. And he said, so it's an uncomfortable situation. Keep in mind, Russia also just recently shot down a U.S. drone using one of its jets. Get this now. After Iran, Saudi Arabia to reestablish ties with Syria. Note that Syria is one of the big targets with this. It says here, Syria and Saudi Arabia have agreed to reopen their embassies after cutting diplomatic ties more than a decade ago, three sources with knowledge of the matter said. A step that would mark, that would mark a leap forward in Damascus's return to the Arab fold. Contracts between Ridia and Damascus had gathered momentum following a landmark agreement to reestablish ties between Saudi Arabia and Iran, a key ally of President Bashir al-Assad. It says a region source aligned with Damascus said. So there's a new alliance forming uh, between Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Syria. And guess what's behind this? Well, the Chinese Communist Party. The CCP is brokering this, align this alliance. 
understand now the picture of this. They're trying, they're attacking U.S. targets in, in Syria. The CCP negotiated a deal between Saudi Arabia, which uh, under Trump had become very pro-U.S. and anti-Iran, was even pro-Israel, as a matter of fact. Saudi Arabia, Iran join up, so to speak. Um, Iran then targets sources, then, then begins targeting you know, parts of uh, Syria, particularly against the United States. Russia starts doing flyovers, uh, threatening U.S. bases in Syria, and the CCP then steps in to broker deals, peace deals, with the surrounding countries to solidify control of this new alliance that's forming over Syria. It says, after years of hostility, Iran and Saudi Arabia have agreed to reestablish relations. This tentative peace was brokered by China after it was announced that officials from three countries had met in Beijing for several days prior to negotiating the deal. This announcement from the three countries marks a new beginning of diplomatic relations between the two Middle Eastern powers and the reopening of embassies between the two Middle Eastern powers and the reopening of embassies in Tehran and Ridia within two months. China's involvement in the, in the deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia comes as a surprise and concern to some as U.S. relations with Saudi Arabia and China have been strained in recent years. Notably, this is from NPR. Now get this as well. China is negotiating an alliance with Saudi Arabia, Iran, and uh, Syria. The same time, uh, Iran is launching attacks against U.S. targets in Syria, and Russia is doing show of force operations, basically telling the United States, stand down or we will attack you. And guess what else is happening? China is trying to broker a deal with Russia and Ukraine. And let me show you. First post says this, U.S. President Joe Biden had said that a Chinese brokered peace plan between Russia and Ukraine is not rational, noting that the proposed plan would only benefit Russia. In an interview to ABC News, which was released on Friday, when he was asked what he thought of Chinese peace proposals that Russia and President Vladimir Putin applauded last week, he said, Biden, I think you answered the question. Putin is applauding it. So how could it be any good? I'm not being uh, facetious. I'm being deadly earnest. I've seen nothing in the plan that would indicate that there is something that would be, be beneficial to anyone other, Russia, other than Russia if the Chinese plan were followed. It's the idea that China is going to be negotiating the outcome of a war that's a totally unjust war for Ukraine is just not rational. He notes China called for a ceasefire in the Russia-Ukraine war on Thursday and outlined a 12-point plan to negotiate peace. The plan includes ending hostilities, resuming peace talks, and addressing the humanitarian crisis the war created. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky signaled some openness to China's proposal, saying China discussing Ukraine was not bad at a press conference on Friday. I should note that after we've paid tens of billions of dollars to Zelensky, they're now saying that they don't have enough money and they don't have the right equipment to launch a counterattack. It raises some questions of what the heck they spent our money on. Um, this is why you need accountability when you'd hand somebody tens of billions of dollars on a regular basis, especially when they're known to be one of the most corrupt countries on the face of the earth. Um, notably, I actually spoke with some Ukrainian contacts, and what they told me was this. They say that their troops can easily go and fight the Russians. They say their troops have the ability to fight and defeat the Russians in many areas. They say they're being told to stand down. Because what I've been told by my own Ukrainian sources is that their own leadership does not want them to win or end the war. Their own leadership wants them to stay there and get paid a million dollars a month because the U.S. is financing it. And as soon as the war ends, the money dries up. Now, we've given them all this money. What are they using it on? They're not using modern weapons in a lot of cases. They're not, they're not getting the types of munitions they claim they need. Uh, they're not buying things. They're not buying Starlink. They're not buying the systems that would allow them to do what they need to do. They're getting handed those things. So what are they using the money on? Well, it's Ukraine, and so a, a lot of that's going in people's pockets, I'll tell you right now. 
But of course, the idea that China could broker a peace deal is a whole other issue. The idea that the Chinese Communist Party could step in, especially if they can offer money. If the Chinese Communist Party can negotiate this deal where the United States could not, because the interest of the Biden administration, and I would argue Volodymyr Zelensky, is to maintain this war, to draw it out, because it's destroying the Russian military. And it's also, um, I think, it's creating, it's creating a conflict which they can use politically, because they can have people, you know, try to drum about patriotism and so on. And it tends to be just a, a way for them to do that. And also because there's a lot of corruption, and I wouldn't be surprised if money was flowing in and out of Ukraine. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised one bit. But the offer there to have peace is, of course, being negotiated by the Chinese Communist Party, whereas the Biden administration is trying to present, uh, prevent peace from taking place. They're the ones who have basically you know, forced the hand of Ukraine to keep fighting. And I would argue some of the leaders in Ukraine very much want that as well, because they're getting rich off this. Every month that, is, that it is delayed is another million dollars they can stuff in their pockets. They want there to be war. Now, the problem with China negotiating peace is that if China negotiates peace, that's going to come with the Chinese Communist Party strings attached, uh, much like you're seeing right now with Saudi Arabia, much like you're seeing now between Saudi Arabia and Iran, much like you're seeing right now between, for example, uh, Syria and some of the surrounding countries in terms of this new deal they're making, and also in terms of what it means for, I think, the global world order. Because what the Chinese Communist Party represents is the China model, this idea that countries do as they like, do as they please, genocides, killing, corruption, that none of this will be held accountable to international law. That is the model of the multipolar world order. That is the model the Chinese Communist Party is pushing. And that is the model the CCP is trying to promote, this end of sanctions. You will only get sanctioned if you criticize the abuses of another country. That is the new world order, folks. And let me show you this, just to emphasize it. They call this the multipolar world order. That's the technical name for it. Um, I will say as well that the United Nations, under the Agenda 2030 program, they're also talking about the multipolar world order. The World Economic Forum is talking about the multipolar world order. And what is the multipolar world order? The multipolar world order is the counter system to the Pax Americana, the peace under America. The multipolar world order is the counter to what you call the unipolar world order. The unipolar world order being the American-led world. And the American-led world represents the opposite of what we just talked about. The American-led world means that if you commit genocides, you will be sanctioned or you will be invaded. The American-led order means that people are protected by basic rights. The American-led order means that countries have certain rules, international standards they have to abide by, or they will be punished. And America has enforced this unipolar world order in the Pax Americana using sanctions, using money handouts, using all kinds of things that have, to an extent, prevented uh, a lot of what history has witnessed and what history will witness again, I believe, very strongly if this ends. And this is what the Russian regime, what the Chinese Communist Party, what even members of the United Nations and even parts of the World Economic Forum are promoting right now. The multipolar world order, every country being able to do as it pleases. Uh, human rights no, more, no longer mean anything if this takes place. Here's Putin in Africa, our meeting with African leaders, most of the African leaders, by the way. Africa will become one of the leaders of the multipolar world order. President, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin stated that Russia prioritizes cooperation with the African countries and will continue to do so. The Russian president said at the second Russia-Africa interparliamentary conference in Moscow, quote, this is Putin, I emphasize that our country gives and will continue to give priority to cooperation with African countries. It says Putin stressed that he is convinced that Africa will become one of the leading countries in shaping the world order. And he said, quote, African countries are constantly increasing their weight and rule in world affairs. It asserts itself with increasing confidence in politics and economy, yeah, sorry, economics. We are convinced that Africa will become one of the leaders of the emerging multipolar world order. And here's one more. 
This is an actual transcript of Putin's speech from the Kremlin's website, the official website. International Parliamentary Conference Russia, Africa, in a multipolar world. This is the actual Kremlin website. This is the transcript of Putin's speech. Putin said, your conference is undoubtedly important in the context of the continued development of Russia's multifaceted cooperation with the countries of the African continent. We also consider this event a key part of the preparations for the upcoming second Russia-Africa Africa summit scheduled to be held in St. Petersburg in July. He said, this conference brings together representatives of most countries on the continent. And folks, this is going piece by piece. This is going through Australia. This is going through all of Asia. This is going through Latin America. Um, I'm going to show you all of this and what's taking place right now. America is being pushed out of the leadership spot. The American idea is being pushed out. And you're watching now socialism, essentially, uh, become the, the, the new system of the world. I'm going to show you a bit more of this. Um, first of all, folks, let's jump over to Epoch TV. My colleague Roman Balmakov has put together a new documentary called Eat the Bugs. Um, of course, you've, we've been talking for a while about the food shortages. We've been talking for a while about some of the weird plans, and they do exist, of the World Economic Forum and many individuals pushing for a rethinking of how we consume food. One of, that, one of those ways they're rethinking it is, well, they want to replace meats with bugs, bug meat, uh, as a way of, uh, you know, giving uh, meat proteins to people, they call it. Now, uh, Roman has been traveling a lot doing this, and he has now a fundraising page for anybody who wants to help finance this documentary, make it possible. Let me show you the trailer for that, then we'll jump over to Epoch TV. For the past six months or so, my team and I have been working on a full-length documentary project. It's called Eat the Bugs, and it exposes a topic that I believe is incredibly important to everyone. The global war on farmers and the, you can say, secret agenda that's behind it, that secret agenda that's pushing it forward. Now, as many of you know, this all started when my team and I traveled to the Netherlands last year in order to cover the protests that were happening there. And after meeting with the local farmers and hearing their stories about how they were going to quite literally lose their generational farms, we were shocked to say the least. But what we realized soon, as we dug deeper into the story, it became obvious that this was not confined to simply the Netherlands. In fact, this war on farmers, this global war on farmers was indeed happening everywhere, including right here in the US. And for some odd reason, it coincided with this trend of celebrities promoting edible insects. And so we have been traveling for the better part of the last year on a mission to really understand this global war on farmers, the agenda behind it, what it means for the future of the food in our supermarkets, as well as what the common people like you and me who are caught up in all this can actually do about it. And right now, we're putting together all the interviews and all the findings from our journey into this new awesome documentary called Eat the Bugs. I really cannot wait to share it with you. And if you would like to help back this project, to help us with the funding to finish editing the thing and as well as to get it out to as many people across the entire world as possible, well, that would be absolutely awesome. You can go to epicoriginal.com forward slash eat the bugs, or you can just click on that link in the description box below. And there you can sign up for updates. You can share the project with your friends and family, and you can donate some funding so that we can share the powerful voices of all these farmers from across the entire world. Let's make it happen. Now, again, folks, that's at epochoriginal.com forward slash eat the bugs. If you want to help make this documentary possible, please go there. And, uh, yeah, Roman, Roman's a great guy. He actually sits behind me in the office. We um, always have fun discussions. <laughs> All right, folks, that's it. Let's jump over to Epoch TV. I will see you there. And, folks, thank you for being here. 